Good afternoon. My name is Ben Greenfield. I'm the Director of Marketing at Helmer Scientific. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Applying Thermoelectric Cooling to Compact Medical Grade Refrigerators. Please feel free to submit questions during the webinar using the questions pane. We will have time at the conclusion of the presentation for your questions. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker. Tom Larkner is the Strategic Products R&D Manager at Helmer Scientific, where he oversees the engineering development of next generation constant temperature products. He is a Bachelor of Sciences in Electrical Engineering from Purdue University and a Master of Science in Engineering from the University of Alabama. He's also a licensed professional engineer. Prior to joining Helmer Scientific, Tom has research and development leadership at both Thermo Fisher and Labstrong. Without further delay, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Tom. Thank you, Beth. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I very much appreciate you taking the time today. And we'll jump right in. So let's talk first some of the objectives for this webinar. First is to discuss a brief overview of thermoelectric history. And then we'll jump in and actually have an example of a basic thermoelectric cooling system. Then we'll discuss some of the historical barriers for thermoelectrics in the world of medical grade refrigeration. And then thermoelectric improvements that support the MLR102 design. Next, we'll review some select MLR102 engineering design considerations and discuss some system options and add-ons. Finally, we'll have a question and answer session. First, though, a very brief his thermoelectric history. In 1821, physicist Thomas Johann Seebeck found that heat applied to a junction of two different material wires created an electric voltage. This has been termed the Seebeck effect. Now, one of the more common uses today of this effect is a thermocouple used to measure temperature. So this is specifically what's going on. A junction of two different wires heated will induce a voltage that can be measured. If you close the circuit, we'd actually induce a current. Interestingly enough, a cool derivative of this effect is the use of powering space exploration. Radioisotope Seebeck effect generators produce a heat, and those power the missions, including Viking, Voyager, Galileo, and Cassini. So there, if you ever wondered why the Voyager is still transmitting information years ago, you can uh, uh, say thank you to Thomas Seebeck. In 1834, Watchmaker and part-time physicist, there's something you don't too, hear too often, uh, Jean Charles Peltier discovered that an electrical current flowing between a junction of two dissimilar metals would cause the junction to heat or cool. Well, between the Seebeck and the Peltier effects here, we we refer to both of these as thermoelectric effects. Well, now that uh, you're experts on the concepts, let's uh, jump in and let's build a refrigeration system out of the uh, thermoelectric cooling. Starting with the very base capability of moving uh, cold and heat is semiconductor material. Same semiconductor material you would find in your phone, uh, or similar at least, in a thermoelectric module. There's, very, there's a very varying type of material that are used. Business Telluride is usually used in refrigeration or cooling applications just based on the temperature range that they can go to. So, and each of these are doped with N or P, and that just means that an impurity is added to the semiconductor. And between the two, we actually get our dissimilar metals that are required, and it also adheres to the direction of, of temperature, the way it'll move. So adding electrical uh, connections between the two semiconductors, uh, that puts the semiconductors in series, but thermally, this is considered three pairs, what you're seeing on the screen, of NP junctions. So there's three thermal conduits that will move temperature. Now, those are attached to a substrate. The reality is it's just similar to a PCB in that the electrical attachment conductor is attached to the substrate, and that substrate is usually an insulator in this case, and in most cases, it's a ceramic. For those thermoelectric modules that are what I would consider a little higher quality, uh, another metallic barrier or substrate is on the other end of the ceramic, not enough to short out, obviously, the 
internal conductors, but allows for a seamless or a much nicer thermal transition to uh, what attaches to the thermoelectric module. So, so how do you actually take the cooler? Well, we take that thermoelectric module and we sandwich it between a couple heat sinks. And if one of those heat sinks is within a enclosed chamber, in this case, this is our refrigeration cooler, uh, we have the really the basics for a thermoelectric cooler. Now, as it says in that one corner here, excuse me, a target is to have the temperature of the external heat sink to re get, stay as close to ambient as possible. And we'll get into that a little bit more, uh, but that's for efficiency purposes. So if we were to tie wires to that thermoelectric module and apply a voltage, in this instance, the voltage, uh, the positive, is applied to the end side. And that is important because it helps direct the current flow direction determines whether or not we're going to be heating or cooling. In this case, we're actually pulling heat out of the chamber and we'll be releasing it into the environment. So we're actually, in this case, cooling the chamber. One of the unique properties of thermoelectric modules is if we actually reverse that voltage and so the direction of current, we now, without doing anything else, we're pumping heat from ambient actually into the chamber. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more coming up, but not only the heat of the ambient we're pumping into the chamber, but any power that we're placing across the time is being pumped into the chamber also. What we're showing here as a thermoelectric cooler is considered what's called an air-to-air -air system. It's because I have two heat sinks, and so it's the air that is going through the heat sink. And in the case of the chamber, if I have a mixing fan, it helps just distribute in, uh, higher uniformity. In theory, the amount of heat removed or moved is proportional to the magnitude of the DC current. So as I increase current going through the TEM module, I can move more heat one way or the other. I say in theory because there's limitations based on efficiencies uh, that occur as we go higher and higher in current levels. Thermoelectrics have been around for a very long time. We saw how long at least the effects have been around. And we currently find them in wine fridges, coolers, and even high-performance optics. So why is use in medical refrigerators new? Well, that really comes down to there are some historical limitations that have occurred with thermoelectric coolers. First and foremost, candidate uniformity generally has not been acceptable with thermoelectric coolers. For medications and vaccines, something between 2 degrees and 8 degrees is the target. Well, to be absolutely positive that you retain or stay within these levels, we really need to target something of a uniformity within the system of plus or minus one. Well, as soon as I've been asking plus or minus one in many of the existing coolers and wine fridges, that is far beyond their, their standard capability with how they're designed. A thermal electric cooler quickly loses cooling capacity with an increasing temperature difference between the ambient and the cabinet internal temperature. One way I like to look at that is if I had two kiddie pools, one full, one not, and I'm standing right between them on level ground, and I want to move the water from one to another, it's simple to go bend down, take a bucket full of water, turn around, pour it into the other pool. If I take that empty pool and I stick it on the first floor or the second floor of my house, and now I have a bucket, I have to climb the stairs and pour it into it. Well, if I stick it on the top floor of an apartment building, now I'm going through uh, many sets of stairs. That's equivalent to the amount of power, or that's similar. So as I change the uh, difference between the outside ambience and the internal temperature, I have to do significantly more work or uh, continually higher work to actually move that temperature. And the more heat that's moved by a thermoelectric module, the less efficient it becomes. In general, if I was moving, say, 50 watts out of a cooler, and it's not necessarily that 50 watts is being generated inside of that cabinet, but I could have 50 watts worth of thermal leakage just through the insulation. So if I'm trying to move 50 watts, it could theoretically take me 100 watts of electrical power to move that 50 watts, but the thermoelectric module, as it sees it, we're moving 
150 watts off of that thermoelectric module. So the more heat that I have to move, uh, the more power I have to use, overall the less efficient it becomes. And for some of the wine fridges and coolers, some of the control schemes are basically on-off powering of the thermoelectric module. A lot of that is due because it's, it's a cheap way to control. It does work, but it can actually lead to long-term material fractures of those N and P semiconductors that I, saw, that I showed earlier. Uh, in the best case, you will get a, a performance degradation over time. In the worst case, you will get a complete break of that fracture and the uh, cooler will, will fail. So, what is different to use thermoelectric technology in the MLR-102 compact medical grade refrigerator? What could it be? Or what is it not? Well, goofy, but it's true. It's not magic alien technology. The physics has remained the same from today as it was previously. Well, what specifically then is it? Well, it's simple to say, but it's not simple necessarily to implement. It is targeted component and system design, the two of those together, along with very tight process controls. And that gets to what we term the advanced core. Getting down to the component level, the thermoelectric module and the associated what we call heat pump used makes a difference. The thermoelectric module devices designed for a system are specifically designed for the voltage and current used. What you're seeing on the screen is uh, equivalent to the TEMS that we, we have that are very high performance, high precision, and targeted at the design. We have a very tightly controlled production process. Starts all the way from material selection, actually to the IGNA cutting, precision PCV assembly, and solder reflow. Uh, between the materials and the processes used, it ends up with a very, very nice device. What you're seeing now, circled in the middle in the, with the, the white TEMS, that's fairly indicative of an industry standard TEM module that you would find if you're uh, Googling uh, TEMS. And the blow up is, shows, again, very indicative of the assembly of one of those modules. And you can see the solder balling and the wicking in the, in the actual module. You know, it just shows a lack of really high performance uh, process control on those. So I'd like to show, say that there's a very big difference between the modules used in the MLR-102 and what's normally found in, in the industry. But here is what makes also one of the major differences. Those multiple TEMs are pre-assembled into the advanced core heat pump. That heat pump allows for extreme resistance to both indirect and direct compression damage. Looking back at those industry modules, the white ones above, and thinking of the thermoelectric cooler we saw a moment ago, the two heat sinks a lot of times would be mounted on the top and the bottom of those thermoelectric modules. And it needs a strong positive contact against those modules to move the heat. Well, any compression that's off-center Will, can damage those modules pretty easy. Think of that picture again where the soldered uh, feet or soldered legs. If we're pushing down on one end of that, we can fatigue that very quickly. Again, best case for uh, some of the industry standards, uh, you get the degraded performance. By virtue of using our heat pump, uh, we have extreme resistance again to compression damage. The heat pump itself is sealed against uh, moisture. So when we're trying to drive something really cold, I'd like to say that you, know, you can get uh, completely isolated heat pumps and thermal assemblies, but moisture does find its way into things. Well, this prevents it from finding its way into the semiconductor material, so it allows for, for long life. How long? Well, we've got proven reliability through extensive thermal cycle testing of these heat pumps. And there is over 100,000 hour life expectancy on that heat pump. In general, and related to designing the TEMS specifically to our application, this thermal heat pump is designed for a high coefficient of performance, which basically is the thermal watts pump to divide it by the power applied. 
ideally one over one, but that's uh, perfection. Uh, we don't have that, but we're working toward it. Well, componentry is great, but it's how that componentry is used in the system that really makes a difference. So in this product, there's a unique COBOL design, again, sized specifically or directly for the application. In the GIF in the top left, you can see uh, we actually have a cold wall in which there are piping with a CO2 internal, and that CO2 will, uh, actually it's, it's cooled to a liquid state, which allows the heat to be flashed against the side and goes back in a vapor state, and so it, it's a continuous circulation. That heat is driven all the way up to the TEM module through the heat pumps, and on the right side, you can see these are actual pictures from the uh, reject heaters from the MLR 102s. And it goes right into a high performance, uh, very nicely designed um, heat reject assembly. Uh, this, I cannot understate just how important it is to get the heat off of the module as quickly and efficiently as possible. There are also fans that uh, go over these um, heating assemblies just to actually pull the heat out even quicker. So as I said, the heat pump smooths. Now with this, you know, how do I know that this really does make a difference and it works well? Well, the system can maintain the set point temperature and uniformity in a 32C in, uh, ambient. That, excuse me, I can't underestimate, or I can't understate just uh, how important, how critical that is. And then also to help maintain that uniformity, we keep a mixing fan in the chamber to make sure a lot of the air moves across the surface of the cold walls uh, continuously. And then there's also the very tight temperature control. I mentioned earlier about on-off control. Uh, these thermoelectrics are driven by variable voltage. And, and that's not something uh, completely novel to that, but there's a cost associated with that to make sure that you're driving this um, you know, very finely. So because of the way it's done by adjusting the voltage rather than on-off, we can apply only amount, the amount of power needed to the thermoelectric modules uh, to obtain the temperatures within the chamber as required. So what were some of the focused engineering design considerations for the medical grade one MLR 102? All right, well, small footprint. That's great, but if that footprint, you can't use the internal space, it doesn't do you a lot of good. Uh, in this case, because the cold wall design with the thermoelectrics, uh, that internal space has been maximized within that footprint. Uniformity of plus or one, minus one degree. You know, it's ideal for medication and vaccine storage, again, that needs to stay within a two to eight degree temperature range. And getting that one plus or minus one degree C uniformity uh, was not a simple uh, undertaking. Mixing fan helps to ensure that uniformity, and there's automatic defrost of the cold wall to maintain those temperatures. Integrated temperature monitoring system, uh, we record what's going on, we know what's going on, uh, we can, between set points and temperature logs and temperature history and the event history, we have all that available, and we have NIST certifiable glycol and air sensors. Included as an access port for supporting independent probes up to seven millimeters. Now here's one thing that's interesting and key about being able to use thermoelectrics. And as I stated, we have targeted design and we have a controller that varies the voltage. So we give it just the amount of power needed. Well, that equates to low energy usage. Now these are some actual numbers uh, we've, we've taken uh, as an example. You know, it's uh, 0.62 kilowatts in 24 hours were required to maintain temperature at 4 degrees C and a 23 C in, uh, excuse me, ambient. That equates to a heat output of about 25 watts. Very low. Uh, this is actually a nice, you don't get a lot of heat being put into your room that you have to pull out. So not only is low heat in a patient area bad, but, you know, this is a design for very low noise. As was mentioned earlier, the fans will run just as much as they need to uh, to help pull heat out. So uh, inherently, they'll slow down when the temperature set point is maintained, uh, which corresponds, again, to a very, very low noise in a patient area. The software. We designed this, again, with temperature and alarm logging. 
And this system includes the min and max temperature, so you can see very quickly uh, what the uh, how far or the ranges above and below, if it got above and below your set point, occurred in, uh, since you last reset it. And obviously, it's like we would need, to, and we did have this UL and CUL certified. Other design considerations, preventive maintenance. Not a lot with this system going on. There's very little in terms of moving parts. Keep the temperature probe bottle filled. Periodically clean the exhaust fans and fins. The same heat reject uh, assembly we saw earlier, um, if you do not take care of it over time, you can get a lot of dust buildup. Well, this is actually pictures from some excessive testing that was done to purposely uh, try to it damage the system and reduce its capability or reduce its ability to maintain uniformity in temperature. So we threw, it was, a lot was thrown at it. Um, and I'm happy to say that even in the situation you see here, uh, it ran fine. But we prefer, you know, for your own benefit, not to get to this point. So, but a simple vacuum will, will you know, prevent this from occurring. Some other system options and add-ons. Well, we provide integration support for medication management systems. In this instance, the Pixis Lock and OmniCell Flex Lock are both available to be uh, installed on the MLR 102. Now, low power allows for the unit to be used with a simple um, uninterruptible power supply battery backup system. You know, given a system in which it was at 4 degrees C internal temp, there was a 24 C ambient, we did some tests. And for an APC BX1200G, this is actually a standard uh, computer backup system that you can go buy at the store. That provided about 2.6 hours of operation uh, upon removal of power. And here's another, an Eaton 5PX1500 with a single pack, provided eight hours, and it comes, or you, allows you to get a second battery pack, had 17 hours of operation. Uh, this is nice to know that if you would be installing this in a location that did not have a backup generator, that some simple off-the-shelf battery UPS systems could be obtained uh, to ensure that your high-dollar medications and vaccines maintain temperature in the event of a power outage. Some other options. Well, we have a certificate of calibration can be obtained. Extended warranty. Ideally, you don't need it, but it's nice to have. Well, given that, hopefully I've been able to uh, provide some information that uh, allows you to understand uh, thermal electrics and how they are implemented in the MLR 102 and allows it to work and function properly and excellently as a compact medical grade refrigerator. Thanks, Tom, for sharing your experience with our audience today. We are now ready to move to questions and answers. As a reminder for our participants, please submit your questions using the questions pane on your screen. If we don't have time for all submitted questions, we'll make sure to follow up after the webinar. So again, please use the questions pane on your screen. Okay, our first question uh, for Tom is, what length of temperature history can be recorded by the unit? Okay. The system has a, a storage card and handles about 4,000 um, measurements. So you have the ability to change the record rate. I think it's uh, approximately 15 minutes uh, in default. Um, that, if memory serves, is about a month to a month and a half of, of recording that will occur. Great. Thanks, Tom. And um, again, as a reminder, please use the questions pane um, on your screen uh, to ask us any questions that you may have. Uh, the next question is, uh, is this technology ENERGY STAR compliant? Okay. Um, with respect to ENERGY STAR, uh, there, there's really not an ENERGY STAR standard today for medical grade uh, equipment. Currently, the EPA is looking at um, releasing one in 2017. Uh, they've been looking at it for a while. Um, and we, we fully anticipate 
we will the Energy Star. But again, uh, it, there's nothing released yet. Uh, any claims that would occur on a refrigerator today claiming Energy Star, though, would be in relation to uh, commercial refrigeration and not medical. So hopefully that that is. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Tom. Um, the next question is, is this unit approved for vaccine storage? Well, um, it's designed for it. Uh, should be you know, two, or it's designed as the CDC guidelines uh, with the data management and the recording of the temperatures and uniformity testing has been done uh, throughout it. We've, we've cataloged it many a time uh, from inside end to end uh, that those temperatures are maintained. So it, it will meet the, the design guidelines for CDC or CDC recommends for vaccine storage. Great. And uh, yeah, just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions that haven't been answered yet, please use the questions pane on your screen. One more I'm done uh, on that is that the uh, min-max is also something that is, is something the CDC would would be um, important to have to prove uh, temperatures over time too. Sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Sam. Uh, um, the next question is, what is the expected life of this refrigerator? Well, as is most of the Helmer product, we you know we target when we design things a, a ten year lifetime. So that's what we target, and that's what we expect. Um, and we've got a, a great service group too over time if uh, things happen. But we've got product that's been in the field for significantly longer than ten years. Uh, but that's our that's our timeline here. Great. Next, uh, the next question is um, is Helmer using this technology on on their larger units? Okay. Well, <laughs> we consider actually the thermal electrics, you know, as we've implemented here, almost an ideal cooling technology for cabinets under two cubic feet. I mean, it is excellent. You know, however, on, on larger units, we're still considering vapor compression, which I would, you know is 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 compressors, uh, to really be the gold standard for those systems. Um, basically to ensure proper pull-down uniformity, uh, efficiency, especially in, in really hot areas, and open-door recovery. So uh, at this stage, uh, you know, the, the thermoelectrics, again, perfectly ideal, but really we're, we're expecting that from about a two cubic foot and under. So we're not anticipating rolling that into higher, into larger systems at this time. Thanks, Tom. Um, we, we have another question. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions that are around um, serviceability. And sure. you know, the questions um, are asking, is the serviceability or um, the, the maintenance or replacement of components uh, something that can be done at a biomed level, or does it require higher, higher level um, service engineers? Now, the, the majority of the systems on this um, if you have a screwdriver, uh, you can you can get to most everything. Um, the like the heat assembly or the the uh, reject assembly that you saw in the back, a uh, couple screws to pull off the back cover. Uh, the fans come off with the back cover. Uh, the, then underneath the re, the reject heat assembly, just a couple screws. Now, I, I'll caveat the differences. You have to be a little careful. Is um, when I mentioned how it compresses, uh, that if you really were to hammer something down on one end, uh, you wouldn't get a good thermal transfer. So uh, there's good instructions out there, uh, but it, it can be done. It just would take care uh, because you'd also have, there's some thermal grease that would have to be done if you're replacing a system. But in general, everything on this is there. There should be very little that could go wrong. There's very few moving parts, fans. Uh, but otherwise, uh, most most things that would need to be done could be done by a biomed. Great, thanks, Tom. And that does uh, look like it, our last our last set of questions. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for participating in our webinar this afternoon. Um, please uh, use the email addresses on your screen if you'd like to contact our Helmer Scientific Sales or Technical Services team. 
If you have any feedback or comments you'd like to share about our webinar, please reach out to me, Ben Greenfield, at bgreenfield at helmerinc.com. Uh, all registrants of this webinar will receive a survey. Uh, we hope to follow up on our event today with additional events um, with topics that are based on your feedback and needs. Uh, so this concludes today's program. Thank you, Tom, and thank you again to everyone for attending our event. Have thank a good afternoon. Everyone.